Hello and welcome to the AV Forums podcast for Wednesday the 30th of March and joining me on this edition are Assistant Editor Steve Withers. You can make a toupee that flies. News Editor Mark Hodgkinson. You've got to go with your gut. And audio reviewer Ed Selly. Oh no, he's like he's like cold. Nice to see you feeling and and, and Once acting. Once more feeling, boys. <laughs> <laughs> hey, Superman Four. Yes, well, th- there is that. Welcome back to the podcast. I uh, hope you all had a nice Easter weekend. We are recording this on a Tuesday morning, which is <laughs> very unusual for us. Uh, to A, be able to string words together at this time of the morning, but also do a podcast. Uh, current competitions. You could win something, Mark. You could. You could still win the Warriors on Blu-ray. And that's um, open till the 4th of April. It says off memory, not even read it. And that's open to what members, is it? Active. Active members. Active <laughs> members. On the, I, I, the, I, I, it actually, is the morning. You know, I, actually, <laughs> I'm, I'm going gonna, gonna to take that phrase back. We're, we're not obviously all here and, and working properly at this time of the morning. No, are we? I'm not. Right. I'm not at my best right now. Um, yes, let's open to active members until the 4th of April and you could win it. Any previous competition winners? Please, not, please. No, no. no. Not yet. It will be soon, obviously. You could have just the 4th of April. cut and paste marks... Um, Comments from last week's podcast, exactly the same. Yeah, and probably more coherent. And better. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> probably better. better to <laughs> together, but. So I, I'm I know gonna... the answer to the correct quiz if they want the question. I know the answer. I could tell them. <laughs> you know the answer if they want the question. Yeah, yeah you really are in a string in your words together very <laughs> well this morning. Eh? Should I come at you first or should I go to Steve for the for the review part? Do you want a bit of time go for waking Steve, up? Go Steve, I'll just drink a bit more <laughs> caffeine and I'll have it with you. Uh, right, okay, so um, we've had a couple of items uh, in for review. We've had a few headaches, Steve. In fact, I, I think most of the week before uh, the Easter weekend, we were all on Skype calls trying to figure out exactly how our reviews are going to be laid out going forward with the new technology uh, that is now within the new TVs out there. And we're talking specifically about HDR. Are are the sets capable of reaching the net levels that they claim? Are they capable of uh, doing the gamma curve correctly? Or as we should be calling it now, the EOTF, uh, is that correct? And, um, you know, just how well do these sets work? And uh, it's been a bit of a headache, Steve. Yeah, it has. It has. To quote... uh... To quote a, a third party we were talking to, it's the Wild West out there right now. Uh, and I don't think they're too far wrong. I mean, our reviews are, are constantly evolving. Obviously, we, we, we ch- change and fine-tune things over, over time and change certain graphs to, to be more informative. Or, you know, but this is um, more, just, more than just a process of evolution. This year, there's a, a huge changes going on. And we're trying our best to reflect that in a way that, A, is informative and, B, understandable. Because it's easy to – you can you can get lost in um, – in the tech jargon, and it becomes meaningless to people. What we want to do is be able to create a series of uh, graphs that reflect what a TV is capable of in terms of both its standard dynamic range performance and also its high dynamic range performance. And it was the HDR bit that's caused us the com- confusion. And we have the equipment to do it now. First of all, you know, part of this process is you have to get a, a test pattern generated that can actually create an HDR metadata signal so that the display will actually receive it as such and go into its HDR mode. You also need software that's designed to measure that and um, create a series of graphs that can measure things like the uh, correct gamma curve, the correct EOTF curve, because that's a specific curve that's being used for HDR. So well, it's 2084, to be precise, I think. Well, it's not a curve for us. Well, no. Now, you see, this this is where it gets it gets confusing because I guess the vast majority of our, our users and our listeners would understand what a gamma curve is. Getting your head around the EOTF um, and the fact that it's actually not a curve is where a lot of confusion comes in. And, and like you say, Steve, it's how do you represent that in a nice, easy-to-understand way so that the the user understands what we're talking about when it comes to... is it, you know, At the end of the day, we just need to know, is the set capable of doing what it says it's, it's supposed to do? But actually getting that across is very, very difficult. We, we, we need to know, does the set do what it's supposed to be doing? But what we also have to understand is what the manufacturer is necessarily claiming it can do may not be representative of what you want it to do, because clearly the manufacturers are in the business of selling TV. So, for example, they all talk about the percentage of DCI coverage that their TVs can do, because clearly that's the biggest number, <laughs> even though they should really be talking about the percentage of our 2020 they can do, because that's the color space within which the uh, Blu-rays, Ultra HD Blu-rays are encoded. 
I'm not saying that they use the entire color space. They don't, but they do use that color space in terms of the way it's encoded in terms of saturation tracking. So they do need to uh, really reflect that, and they don't because obviously they want to quote the largest number possible. Also, what's interesting is that because uh, HDR10 is open source, how they um, implement HDR10 is entirely up to the manufacturer. So there could be different versions of it being implemented by different manufacturers, and it is really quite confusing. So our ultimate goal was to create a series of graphs that get across the information in an easy to understand and easy to um, see format. Basically. Okay, so there are there is a lot of jargon, and we will have an interview with Spectrical. It's going to go up on the sixth of April, uh, and obviously before that podcast goes out and before the interview, we'll go through the jargon. But we've already touched on on one part: gamma and EOTF is is the name for it. So Mark's had his coffee now. So what does EOTF mean, Mark? Yeah, it's uh, it stands for electrical optical transfer function. And in what way is that different from the curve? Then, uh, Mark, explain it for us. It's it's a new response based on the, how digital displays can actually work instead of um, adjusting for how a CRT used to behave. Right. Uh, and it's it's close to a gamma power law of two point four, which is quite often what we use in our reviews. But there's more emphasis on what you see in the dark areas. Yeah. So uh, briefly, it's it's how the the eye sees things, and CRT has always had what we call the curve, which was uh, darker in the bottom area or, or the darker area of the of the image, um, and then it was a nice gradual curve to get brighter. Whereas yeah. this time around, it's more of a straight line from from black to white. So rather than curving round to give it that nice CRT look, it's now a straight line. But this is because digital displays are able to give us more information and we're able to get more bits into the darker area to uh, represent the darker area of the image. That sounds fair. So obviously moving on f from that point, which is different because we're, we're now doing away with what we used to do in the past, Steve, with uh, you know making, making images look a certain way because that's how they've always been done from the days of CRT and, and even through plasma and LE LCD, we've always had uh, the old gamma curve. The next thing that gets in the way is PQ. And uh, PQ, some people might think that stands for picture quality. <laughs> Easy mistake to make. What does it stand for, Steve, and, and why is it important? Uh, yeah, PQ stands for perceptual quantization. And the, the basic idea behind the, P, behind the PQ is then it's designed to replicate the way the human eye works as close as possible. That, that's the idea behind it, the idea that modern displays are vastly superior performance to old CRT displays on which most of the previous standards were based. So creating a new a new PQ, and I hasten to not use the word curve, but uh, EOTF, is that um, it's designed to replicate closer, as close as possible the way that the human eye works. And it was largely developed initially by uh, Dolby. Dolby developed it. Um, basically thinking, well, okay, we, we can move beyond CRT now, so what would we do? If we were building something from scratch right now, what, what approach would we take? And their approach was, well, we'd try and replicate the human eye's performance. And that was the idea behind it. So from that stem, you know, from that grew the whole idea of Dolby Vision um, and the idea of having um, a, a peak brightness that goes up as far as high as 10,000 nits, although, you know, the human eye's performance can go even higher than that. But that was what they were using as their idea. And then eventually they, they sort of, took that information and passed it out to the rest of the industry and it became um, 70ST2084, which is the EOTF, that is PQ, that is used for HDR. Yep, and, and obviously it allows, again, what we were talking about before, more bits to be used because uh, that's the whole quantization. Quanti <laughs> okay, it's hard to say. Quantization. Quantization, yeah. that's the whole part of that. Um, it, the perceptual part of it is uh, it... it it's so you perceive it to be the more detail to be in the blacks, basically. I think that's the simplest way I can explain that. Um, it allows more bits to be used in a in a in a smaller space. It's 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 how we perceive light in in real life, isn't it? Yeah, basically. And, and, and trying to quantize a quanti no, hang on. <laughs> and trying to quanti quantify it. Why don't they use that word? Trying to quantify it in in um, in terms of digital information. Yeah, that's all. So, to do. so as you can already see, it's getting this to a level where it's nice and easy to follow and understand is very, very difficult um, because there is a lot of technology behind this. There's a lot of acronyms. There's a lot of uh, different ways of thinking, basically. And, and, you know, hands up, this has been a bit of a learning... I'm going to say that word again. <laughs> <laughs> 
this, this has been a bit of a learning curve. A learning for, EOTF. For, for, yeah, a learning EOTF for a all learning of us. learning radius. <laughs> um, and hopefully we're going we're gonna to get there where um, certainly the next review that goes out is going to have a lot more information out and we'll be looking for feedback basically to say where people are getting stuck, what people understand and the way that we're getting it across in the graphs and so on. I mean, these are things that we can change going forward. And as Steve says, I mean, our reviews always evolve uh, when new things come to light or people want things done a certain way or we think things need to be changed to make them easier to understand, then we will do that. So the next review that's coming out is the first sort of flagship TV from Samsung. It's the second tier TV, Steve. Yeah, it's their, I guess it's their flagship edge lit television. It's the KS9000. That should be hitting stores, I think, uh, this week or, or, or certainly early next week. So it's it's out very soon. Um, obviously, the actual flagship will be the KS9500, which is the full full array backlight TV. That won't be arriving until the 23rd of May. But the uh, the KS9000, it's um, edge lit. It's capable of delivering uh, over 1,000 nits of peak brightness. Uh, it supports HDR10. Um, it uh, delivers 96% of DCI B3 uh, and um, includes their brand new um, smart platform, which is a, a kind of a updated version of the Tizen platform that they launched last year. It uh, also has the new smart controller, which can be used as a universal controller. It has auto detect, so it can detect um, devices when you plug them in. So if you plug in, say, a, an Xbox One, it will detect it as such, set it up for you, which is quite clever, I have to say. Um, and also includes the you know the latest design is curved of course but there is an alternative if you don't want curved you can buy the KS8000 which is basically identical except it's a flat TV rather than a curved TV um, and it includes um, Samsung's new 360 degree design although I must admit I don't tend to look at the back of TVs very often but it's a very attractive TV um, and in terms of reviewing it what we try to do is approach it from the point of view of you're still going to review I mean, let's not get let's get this straight from the beginning uh, it's still vitally important that the tv delivers all it should do with the current standard so in terms of rec 709 uh, grayscale d65 all these things need to be accurate because the majority of the content you're going to be watching for the foreseeable future will still be using that so it's important it still can do that but at the same time obviously we want to test how it performs in terms of hdr given what we currently know and what we have in terms of our test patterns and our, our generator and the, and the software and what the manufacturers are claiming it can do. So what we're looking at is, can, you know, can it hit 1,000 nits? How close is it, is it to um, ST2084? Um, what percentage of DCI does it, does it measure? But also, more importantly, how does it track against um, REC2020? These kind of things are the things we're looking at. Uh, and in terms of the, in terms of the uh, KS9000, uh, from the REC 709 old world view, very, very good. Um, extremely accurate, tracks very closely to REC 709 in the um, custom mode, custom color mode. Uh, nice, flat, very good, um, very accurate out of the box, but easy to get uh, ruler flat grayscale performance with um, just, just using the two point actually is all I need to do. I didn't even use to, need to use a 10 point, although it is available if you do. Uh, you get a nice, accurate D65 color temperature for white and um, very nice picture. Great upscaling if you're watching non-4K content. And overall, really, 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 really good. Uh, obviously, Steve, you know, this is a, an edge lit. I, I believe the LEDs are at the bottom of the screen on this one. So what was the uniformity like? Uniformity was, I have to say, extremely good. And this is an actual retail sample. It's not like a golden sample or, um, uh, you know, or a pre-production model. This was a sample straight out of the factory, in the box, ready to go to the store, sent to me brand new, hadn't even been opened. Uh, so I was actually quite surprised at how at how um, uniform the backlight was because, you know, with edge lit TVs, there's always a bit of a lottery sometimes and they have got better and better at doing it. And I've got to say, this is probably the most uniform edge lit TV I've seen. And interestingly, as you say, Phil, unlike previous generations of Samsung, the, the LEDs aren't at the edges, at the sides, they're at the top and bottom because apparently that's the best way for them to get the kind of brightness they were looking at for um, for HDR. Depending on how you set it up, how noticeable the backlight above and below will be will vary. Um, in a very dark room, you can occasionally see some brightness at the top and bottom, where, um, with particularly with letterbox footage. But I've got to say, even even then, not that noticeable at all. Uh, particularly when you're watching HDR content, where I thought that would be a bigger issue. But because to get the best HDR performance and the most peak brightness, you need to use the high um, local dimming setting. Actually, uh, even uh, in a darkened room, it delivered a really really. Yeah, you know, really good image without 
bright corners, bright edges, or, or columns of light. I, I was quite impressed. Also, the local dimming itself, which has always been something that Samsung have been quite strong at, very good as well. Even in the high setting, it was relatively free of, of haloing, as long as you were sat, you know, in, in front of the TV. As soon as you start to move off-axis, it does become more apparent. Although I've got to say that the off-axis performance of this TV was definitely better, in my experience, than the previous generation, um, partly because they're using uh, new quantum dot technology. So overall quite impressive i have to say very impressive tv uh, both with standard dynamic range content and high dynamic range content uh, the one area perhaps where it does fall down slightly is in terms of tracking against red 2020 it is basically tracking against dci p3 and from what we understand that is not the way it should be tracking because that's not how the blu-rays are being encoded so just to clarify that point the blu-rays yeah, when the the disc certainly when the film's finished, it's finished at DCI P three. But when it's put on the desk, it's basically given a remap to Rec twenty twenty. So that mainly goes for green. Um, so, so green is the one which between the two uh, gamut is off the furthest. So certainly it it's given the coordinates to to track to Rec twenty twenty on the disc and the display should be able to do that so the display should be able to show that and track to 2020 and this is where some do it really well like the Panasonic 902 the DX yeah, that was really impressive does that really well because it's got the loots built in there the 3D lookup tables built in there that helps it hit those points now the last graph that you sent me of the to have a look at of the KS9000 it was kind of in the middle <laughs> It wasn't quite DCI green, but it wasn't quite Rec 2020. It was kind of in the middle. Um, so it was getting there, but not quite. Yeah. And uh, one approach I thought I might take was maybe I could go to custom and see if I could um, uh, calibrate it closer to tracking Rec 2020. But in fact, if you use the custom setting, it basically goes to the Rec 709 color space and then you're going you're starting from there so you're a long long way from where you want to be initially which means i don't think that would be an approach you could actually take um the best approach would be for samson to actually create a color space a native color space which is obviously the largest color space um that tracks to rec 2020 rather than tracking to trying to track towards dci p3 um and we will feed that information back to them because clearly you know, if that's the way the disk's being encoded and mapped, then that's what they should be trying to uh, replicate. In terms of um, the uh, actual peak brightness, we use a 10,000 nit pattern to ensure that the TV is mapping to uh, that, that 10,000 nit test pattern to its 1,000 nit capability. Um, the idea is, you know, if it isn't doing it properly, you'll see clipping, which we didn't. So it is doing that correctly, although obviously the majority of content currently is actually 1,000 nits, with the exception of Warner Brothers' Ultra HD Blu-rays, which apparently are, are actually encoded at um, 4,000 4, nits. Yeah. Right, so uh, overall, Steve, you know, it is Edgelet. I mean, one of my issues with Edgelet is going to be how well does it handle HDR. I know you're saying it, it's pretty well, but when you get a scene where it's one bright object against a, a dark background, because there aren't zones behind it, um, and because it's not a self-emitting uh, TV as well, uh, so it's not down to the per-pixel basis, how well does does it handle that? It, I've got to say, surprisingly well, Phil. I've got to. I, I, I'm. I was watching a film last night. I watched you know a whole film in HDR, and in at night with the lights out, a little bit of light, a little bit of bias lighting, but it was a pretty dark room. And I thought it had for an edge lit display. I thought it handled in, in HDR. I thought it handled it really well. I was quite surprised at how effective it was, and how little of that kind of column of light or even light edges you were seeing. It was a letterbox 2.35 to 1 movie, so there were the black bars at the top and the bottom, which is always a good test of how effective it is. And, um, you know, when the title of the film came out, which was wild, it was just the white uh, letters in the middle against a black background. And even then, it, it wasn't especially noticeable. So um, w whatever Samsung are doing to mitigate this as much as possible, they're doing it very well. I mean, I've never been a particularly big fan of edge-lit LCD TVs for, for the reasons you've already mentioned. But... Uh, of the ones I've seen today, I'd say this is definitely one of the best in terms of delivering a really good picture, given the limitations of technology that's being used. Um, one area where I think it will struggle is because we, we can test how bright something is using windows. So we can get smaller and smaller windows. And one thing I need to do is just try on a really, really tiny window to see how it handles it. Because obviously, unlike a, um, what, either a TV that's self-emitting, like an OLED, or a TV with a lot of zones behind this panel, like the uh, DX902, which is a, has, has uh, over 500 zones behind the screen. Once you get down to a very small um, 
area, you know, how effective you can control the light in that area, given that you're lighting it from the edges, uh, it remains to be seen. But uh, certainly my experience of actually watching an entire film in HDR, I found it to be a, a hugely enjoyable experience. And I thought the picture was absolutely stunning. Yeah, but let's just call it clarify that it wasn't perfect, though. No, of course yeah. not. Because, you know, we don't want people getting really excited thinking that we're talking. There are still issues there, Steve. But I was looking for problems and, and not finding many, which, which surprised me because uh, I was expecting there to be more issues than I did discover. So I think, um, I think given the limitations of edge technology, I think Samsung are implementing it in a very effective way. So moving from HDR and uh, 4K, let's go at normal viewing on this TV. So how did it stack up and did you watch the England game the other night and, and was there any banding or stuttering or any issues? Uh, I did watch some of the England game, yes. Much to my surprise, we won it. <laughs> No, I haven't had any issues with with, with motion handling, stuttering, uh, frame dropping. So that's that in that sense. That, and those have been issues in the past, but I, certainly not on this model. I don't think we any banding either. I, I thought I thought, like I said, I thought the backlight uniformity in the way that it handled itself was really good. And and I think as as a you know for a Rec Seven Hundred Nine normal full HD content TV, it's really solid, really strong. Uh, I mean, it delivers a, a night. I mean. For an LCD, it delivers a really nice picture. The native black levels are 0.03, so the VA panel works well. The color accuracy is excellent. The grayscale is really good. I thought it was a, a great... I mean, if, you buy, if you're looking for a, a competitively priced TV that's going to do everything you want it to do, uh, you're going to, this is definitely going to be on your shortlist. No question about it. Okay, and, and obviously you mentioned the VA panel, so what's the viewing angles like? I mean, do you have to be sitting bang on to get the best out of this? As with any VA panel, I think to get the very best performance, yes, you want to be sat bang on. Um, but like I said earlier, I do think it, it holds up off axis better than previous VA panels from from um, from um, Samsung. And uh, I forgot to mention it also uses a moth eye filter on the front of the panel, which helps reduce any uh, ref reflections, which have been an issue, particularly with curved TVs. I think you can get some unusual reflections with them. This definitely eliminates, not, it doesn't eliminate all reflections, but it certainly minimizes them. Um, so if you're watching TV in a room with a lot of light in it, and you know, the reality is a lot of people do watch, do watch TV with light in the, in the lounge, either during the day or even in the evening. Uh, I think the moth eye panel d definitely helps, uh, Im improves the perceived black levels. Um, the local dimming is very effective, and the native black levels are good on the panel. So all in all, it's capable of delivering quite a, quite a good, you know, a really good looking black level for an LCD television. So that, again, that's another area where I think uh, Samsung have been quite strong. Also, really like the new platform, the new smart platform. Um, it might be slight, somewhat derivative of another platform we could mention, but uh, it works really well. It's simple to use, it's intuitive, um, and the auto detect stuff is really good. And the remote control, I really like that too. Um, so I think uh, as a total package, it's very strong. Okay, we'll come back to the player in a in a few minutes because we're going to go uh, to Mark now, who should have woken up and uh, yep. had enough caffeine. I'm going to have some more of my Easter egg. <laughs> so it's like I'm on a sugar high. <laughs> you're on, yeah, I was wondering what you're 100 miles an hour at the minute. Anyway, so you can go and settle and let, let your heart rate drop a little bit, have some more chocolate. So, Mark, you've had the uh, the Panasonic DX700 for a little while now. What do you think? Uh, still slightly in the early stages because of the bank holiday weekend and the lack of TV viewing. But um, this is uh, the entry-level HDR TV from Panasonic. So this is 58-inch. Uh, we'll set you back about £1,200, apparently. Um, now, uh, it's it's not without its issues, I, I have to say. Um, as, as you touched upon before, Phil, we're some calibration... Uh, and clipping issues at the minute which could be it's pretty much definitely not settings within the tv so i think it's settings within the software somewhere um, but we're getting clipping basically it just falls off a cliff at 75 percent and there's no more detail <laughs> after that so between 75 and 100 with it with hdr content i should stress uh, we're losing everything so um or apparently are so we've got we've got to do some more uh looking into the uh, software settings i think uh, and perhaps even the um generator um in, ter in terms of because oh, this is basically all i've watched uh sdr content it's it's decent um the out of box performance is fairly accurate grayscale it's tracking you know within three um it's hitting rec 709 very accurately and tracking back really well um it's another edge lit set uniformity isn't great like the samsung there are several uh blotchy pools of lighting you can see on dark backgrounds uh, just left center of screen and then to one towards the top of the screen and there's quite they're quite large and quite noticeable also it doesn't really handle um low bit rate stuff very well so the blacks 
can be really quite noisy. It's very poor off access. It's shockingly bad off access. I thought there was. I, I, was, I was watching uh, House of Cards 4K last night, and I was lying on the couch, and I thought there's something wrong. <laughs> there was something wrong with the telly, but there wasn't. It was just literally because I was what, 45 degrees off center. I moved back into the middle of the screen, and it looked perfectly well. So that is a real consideration if you're um, if you've got people watching it not from bang on. Got the um, that old Samsung problem. I, I highlighted this last year. It, the old CMR uh, processing on the Samsungs where you would get stuttering after um, motion changes in in, uh, in content, so say slow motions of sports, and then it would come back into the normal the normal speed, then there would be stuttering. Well, this panel does that quite a bit, uh, and not just with slow-mo stuff. Um, there is quite a bit of stuttering, I've noticed, particularly on when I've been watching the sport. Yeah, I, 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 can't, I can't get HDR to play out from Amazon apparently that should be available but it's definitely not available as of now so I've, I've not seen anything other than clips from USB uh, and even then I'm not convinced it's it's clicking perfectly into place that doesn't look quite right either so yeah it, it's obviously it's in its early stages but it's it's not without its issues um, I like the Firefox platform I didn't really play with it a great deal last year I didn't I didn't review that myself um, but yeah it's nice and simple that um, I, I like the way the Firefox is laid out and the way you can just bolt on what you want instead of being faced with all sorts of uh, crap you don't. Yeah, it's the, the, the stand's good. So the uh, it's got the adjustable uh, feet, so you can have them in the, towards the centre or out on the outsides um, if you've got a long enough unit. Uh, decent remote. It's just a stand. You don't get anything, any fancy smart controllers. You just get the the silver Panasonic classic TV remote. Yeah, I, I've been. Uh, it's it's a mixed reception for me at the minute. It's it's okay, but it's it's not great. Um, and we've got to get over these clipping issues as well with HDR. Yeah, I mean, getting that technology into a, a twelve hundred pound TV, and obviously the the smaller screen sizes are, are cheaper again. Um, it, it's a big ask. I think so. I think um, it's probably. I think it might be too big an ask. Um, just the dimming system. I'm not. That's really not good either. It, Panasonic have never done local i mean edge dimming really uh, very well at all not many do to be fair but um panasonic have really struggled with it and it doesn't this shows no sign of improvement whatsoever in fact i would have it off because it, it it literally it flashes it pulses anytime there's a mixture of content on the screen and uh, so yeah, i would definitely have that off and, and to be fair when you've when you've got the hdr stuff on that brings down the errors quite a lot if you turn it off uh, which was slightly counterintuitive to me but um yeah and it slightly lessens the impact because the blacks obviously look not so black, slightly grey. Black levels are, are okay. Nothing, nothing special really. Uh, and I say the dim, the dimming system, uh, it's not one I'd recommend at all. So at this present moment in time, it it's got a lot to do to impress you. Um, yeah, it has. It's some way to go. Yeah. Um, coming from, um, I've been, I've had a Samsung, one of the last year's Samsungs here, for quite a while. Uh, I'm just waiting on them picking it up next time they drop one off. I would say that was a better TV all around for. For 4K, obviously it doesn't do HDR, but for 4K and and, and your standard HD stuff, that impresses me more in, in almost every way, to be honest. Right, and that's the same price level, is it? Yeah, more or less, yeah. 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 Okay, it's a shame because the, the, the DX902 has been an absolute stonker of a TV, but then I guess you know when you're making TVs to a certain price point and trying to squeeze a lot of technology in there at, at the price point, and it's edge lit again. We're going to have issues. I, I guess this is where we're going to see more and more and more issues when it comes to HDR stuff and edge light. I mean, although that KS9000 did a pretty good job, Steve, uh, it's still open, certainly in the lower parts of the market, to be a, a, a real mess for some. I think um, where we're going to, where TVs are going to struggle, is, and I think this is probably one of the reasons why the, the DX700 might be struggling a little bit with HDR content, is when you're trying to map 1,000 or 4,000 nit content to a 300 nit TV or 400, 335. Yeah, just 335. That's a big ask to map yeah. it effectively. Um, you know, it's, and, and that might be an issue. As far as the viewing angles go, that is the, the one weakness of the DX902. Uh, that also had pretty narrow viewing angles, optimal viewing angles, should I say. Yeah, but we're not interested in other people watching the TV. As, <laughs> well, as long yeah, as we're all right, right in the middle. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, 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 personally, I'm not normally, but. Because Jenny's away, I, I thought I'd lay, I lay on the couch and watch some telly. But uh, yeah, I wouldn't recommend it from that. Yeah, from that no. But as Mark says, for for a family maybe where there's four or five of you and you're going to be sitting along in, along this rear wall or something in a line, then then viewing angles become a lot more important. Um, and and certainly, you know, with some of these VA panels, they are quite restrictive. 
Um, and like I said, I'm impressed that Samsung have managed to improve on that from last year because they had that problem last year, definitely. They were very restrictive last year, much less so this year. Okay, so it's interesting. We, we got the first two TVs in. We've had we've had three now, but the first sort of two that gives us a, a bit of an indicator. I mean, the KS9000, its price tag is over two grand, isn't it? Uh, it's just, yeah, just over two grand. Yeah. Just over. And the 700, the 58 inches, 1,200 pounds. So getting a, a pretty decent spread there in the market and, and those issues. And there's going to be more and more issues as we go on this year. I have no doubt whatsoever about that. But again, the other flip of the coin is exciting times. We've actually got new technology coming to market is actually starting to arrive now and, and Steve you've had uh, Samsung's K8500 Ultra HD Blu-ray player for over a week now and you played not just on the Samsung but you played on some other uh, displays as well so give us the lowdown on, on the plastic player. Yeah let's do with the bad stuff first it, it is no question about it regardless of what price point it might come in at it is uh, a bit plasticky Definitely. I mean, it is made of metal, but it's very thin metal in it. And it's, it's light and it doesn't have the, the solid build quality of the Panasonic that we've also seen. Um, it doesn't have a display on the front. I'll just point that out. It didn't actually notice. I, did, I know you noticed it from the editing the videos. It hadn't occurred to me until I actually plugged it in. I thought, well, hang on, there's no actual display. Um, now, some people might think that's a good thing because people think displays can be distracting. But it does mean if you want to look quickly, look at the player to see what time the film's at or what's, you know, anything like that, you can't do that. You have to pull up the display on the screen. Um, that just means a button press, but it, it just pointing it out. The tray, when it comes in and out, it's pretty rickety and it does sound a bit uh, uh, cheap, to be honest. Uh, although it's relatively quiet in operation, which is a good thing, although you can hear it sometimes um, changing, you know, navigating discs and that kind of stuff. So that's the, the downside. Otherwise, the, uh, the menu and the layout, you know, and the setup is all basically the same as a standard... Um, um, Samsung Blu-ray player. It's it's uh, it's, it's fairly it's, it's intuitive. Uh, it's it's an attractive graphical layout. Something that's pretty straightforward. You don't need to do very much. Um, certainly, the one I had uh, deep color was already off, which is something you definitely need to make sure that's off. But it was off as, as a default position. So maybe Samsung had changed that since the US players launched. Um, it should automatically detect. Uh, certainly with Samsung's. Uh, this year's TVs, the new the, the, the twenty sixteen models, it detects um, HDR and automatically um, sets itself up anyway. But it seemed to do that with other displays that I've tried it on as well. So, uh, as far as I can tell, fingers crossed, it should it should work as long as your TV supports HDR and is able, capable of telling the player that through its EDID and vice versa, then everything should connect up fine. With the KS nine thousand, um, just plugged it in, all connected. Uh, what I did was I basically t tried, I, I got, um, I had Mad Max, for example. Now, that's a, a disc we've seen quite often in demos. So what I did was I set up the TV here for one input with a blue, with a standard Blu-ray player, set that up with a nice bright picture, but a bright picture that's accurate, not just pushing the uh, backlight out to max and then blowing out all the whites, but actually setting it up so I had an accurate, bright, accurate, nice looking picture for the Blu-ray. And then I did the same thing and, and set up the uh, UHD HDR, um, player and had that input set up correctly um, given the, you know, what we discovered from our testing process was the best setup for uh, for HDR content and then I was comparing the same scenes over and over again like the scene that you've seen I know Phil where they go into that massive uh, dust cloud and storm with lightning and everything and uh, there was no question even though that Mad Max Fury Road which was uh, a 2k digital intermediate there is a, a, a slight hint there's, there is more detail in there um, than you can see on the blu-ray um, and that's down more to I think the encoding and the HDR than it is to actually the actual uh, source being more detailed necessarily but the uh, impact of the of the HDR definitely makes the image more dynamic no question about that and I don't mean that as a pun it, it, it is it is more dynamic uh, the colors um, looked more realistic at times there was more detail in in, in bright parts of the image uh, and it, it, it just when you go backwards go back to the blu-ray it just feels kind of you know oh, this doesn't look, it's a bit, a bit disappointing really uh, i also tried it with chappie which is a 4k uh, um, digital intermediate and again there was there was it wasn't a, uh, in terms of detail levels it's not night and day there, there is clearly more detail there than there is on the blu-ray but it's not a massive amount of detail and that's one of the reasons you can understand why they're doing things like hdr because just going to to 4k on a 55 inch screen isn't that big an impact as you might expect but um but adding in the hdr certainly gives the image more more more, more impact um and you know then 
I watched Wild. Now, Wild is just a film about a woman walking away up the west coast of America. There's no effects. There's no explosions. It's, uh, it's, but there's a lot of lovely scenery shot in, in, in the film. And I watched that last night. So I thought it would be a good test of seeing what, what impact HDR would have just on a film about somebody walking through some pretty scenery. And I'll tell you what, it looks stunning. It looks absolutely stunning. I was really impressed with the impact it had in terms of making it because it, it made it just look more realistic. You know, when she's out there and the sun is shining, the sun really looks like the sun. Um, it, I just felt uh, that the film had this sense of dynamism that I wasn't getting, or I wasn't at least didn't feel like I was perceiving before with the normal Blu-ray. So... Um, in that sense, the player works great. I mean, people will debate that there are two players coming out on the 11th of April, uh, along with a bunch of discs. So the people will debate which player to buy. Obviously, if prices are factor, the Samsung will be cheaper. Build quality isn't as good as the Panasonic, but if you're going out over HDMI, um, as opposed to going for something like analog outputs and that kind of stuff, then clearly the differential between the two is, is there is no difference. They're both going to be the same. They're both made to the same standards. And in terms of Blu-ray, they're both using the same digital output. And, uh, you know, from my experience so far, as a player, uh, yes, it's a little bit plasticky, but it delivers the goods in terms of um, Ultra HD, 4K, Blu-ray and HDR. Now, um, let's come back to the PQ, yeah, um, because that makes a big difference. And again, we're not talking about picture quality, we're talking about Steve. You're talking about... <laughs> you want me to say what it is? Yeah. <laughs> Perceptual quantization. Yeah. Um, yes. <laughs> so, so the effect, like we said uh, before, it, it gives more freedom in terms of where we can, or, or certainly when a, a disc's master or, or you know the color grading's done and so on, it gives more access to the darker areas. Um, so you're not just getting blocky blacks; you're actually getting a lot of detail in there. And interestingly, where the the perception is that HDR discs um, or certainly 4K HDR discs are going to be far brighter, actually they can be. Quite a bit darker. Yeah, yeah. They're, they're, you could, what you'll find is in the darker scenes, they can be darker, but with more detail in there than you would perhaps have noticed before. But also within within a single scene, you could have darker parts and brighter parts. And I, I guess, that, I don't know, it's difficult to describe it, but there's a greater sense of, like I said, realism or, or dynamism to the film. So dark parts are darker, bright parts seem brighter. And that, and that range between dark and bright gives the image the kind of punch that you wouldn't necessarily expect. What was also absent completely, I didn't notice any banding at all, which again should be the case with 10-bit. With um, and there were you know, dissolves and shots with lots of sky, because it was you know, she's out in the outdoors. So lots of sky shots, lots of big sky shots and, and, and big areas of, of, of similar looking you know, in terrain. And again, that was free of any, any, any apparent banding to me. So Trying to describe something like this is actually difficult. I think when you see it uh, set up correctly, I have to say, <laughs> when you see it set up correctly, you will think, oh, that looks really good. I mean, even Laura last night was, was aware of the fact. She said, oh, that looks really nice. And I said, oh, no, this is, I hadn't told her what we were watching until after she started watching it. And I said, does it look different to you? And she said, it does look more, uh, more realistic. And I said, yeah, that's because it's uh, a 4K HDR and I had to explain what all that meant, which took about an hour. <laughs> but, uh, um, but yeah, even, even she as a, as a, as a neophyte could, could understand that was, was uh, and he immediately thought something seemed different about, about what we were watching. So, uh, and having compared full HD to 4K, just in terms of resolution, I can see why manufacturer studios might be pushing HDR as a way of making the stuff. Cause it, otherwise the difference isn't that, that apparent, but it definitely is apparent when you switch between an SDR and HDR image. So let's go, Ed, for the final word on the hardware section. So, Ed, you've listened to all that. What do you yeah, it's been, it's been all right. As, uh, I don't know if you saw the message I have, I've had. Um, this time of year, we get uh, ducks in the garden. Um, and uh, we've had a pair of them pottering around, which I've enjoyed watching. And one of them got stuck in Will's playhouse. So I had to go and um, outside and extract <laughs> it. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, it's been I, all good. I mean, you know, I'm, I'm little little the wiser about this this hdr business i'm sure i'll catch up slowly and painfully in the ensuing years but i'm glad that you guys are having a wonderful time with it thanks ed thank you thanks Fred. <laughs> <laughs> anyway uh, i think we spent enough time on hardware this week we'll be back in a sec with movie reviews and we've actually got a review this week we What did you go and see at the cinema, Steve? I did actually go to the cinema th uh, this weekend, so I can genuinely review a film for a change. I went to go and see Batman vs Superman: Dawn of Justice, of course, 
And I'm going to have a bit like with Terminator Genesis. I'm going to go against critical um, opinion at the moment because uh, I rather enjoyed it. I thought it was great fun. I, obviously, I, I, I should start by saying I'm not a big comic book fan. I mean, I like comic book movies, but I don't know a lot about the comic, comics themselves. I haven't really read them since I was a really young kid. So I know sod all about Batman and Superman in terms of their comic book personas. And so, you know, if, if I'm not like some people going in who are real fanboys and wanted this and wanted that. I didn't go in with much in the way of expectations. In fact, after the second trailer, my expectations were pretty low. And maybe that was one of the reasons why I enjoyed it more. But I found it to be, uh, a I mean, a little bit po-faced. You know, it could have done with a few more laughs, perhaps. But in terms of it looked stunning, the money's up on the screen. Ben Affleck is without doubt the best screen version of Batman ever in my opinion. I think he absolutely nails Bruce Wayne and Batman. I thought the way they presented Batman in terms of the Batcave, in terms of the costume, in terms of the equipment was all spot on. I thought he played a, an older, brooding, slightly cruel and, you know, a damaged Batman really well. I, I thought I thought easily the best thing in the film. If they, if they, he's going to be doing a, sing, a standalone Batman movie and I can't wait because I think that's going to be fantastic. Uh, I thought Henry Cavill was good again in Superman. As good as he can be within the limitations of the character. And I thought that the, 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 the way that they built up to their, you know, battle, if you like, was, um, was very well done. The, the first sort of, the first third of the film really addresses the devastation at the end of Man of Steel, which I thought was a quite a clever thing, because, I mean, by doing that, they, A, you kind of makes Man of Steel better, I think, because you can think, okay, they are addressing the fact that thousands were killed and, and they leveled half of Metropolis. So that bit's addressed in the beginning of the film, particularly from the perspective of Bruce Wayne, who thinks, you know, we've got this alien on the planet, he could, if he would turn bad, destroy us. You know, if that's a, even a 1% chance that we need to do something about it. Then you've got uh, Lex Luthor manipulating the two of them to get them to end up fighting each other. The battle itself is absolutely brutal. I don't know how it got a 12A rating because it's really, really quite vicious at times. And apparently there's a longer cut coming out in the summer when it comes out on Blu-ray and Ultra HD 4K Blu-ray. Half an hour longer. So the film itself was two and a half hours long. This is going to be a three-hour cut, R-rated cut, much more violent. Definitely, I felt like there was time. There was there was one specific scene, which I'm not quite sure whether it was meant to be a dream or a flash forward or uh, someone sending a message from the future. Clearly, it's designed to be setting up something in another another film. But it, it did. It was quite a cool scene on its own. But for, for me, at least, as a non comic book fan, I obviously didn't get any of the, any of the references, and I was like, well, "What's that all about?" So that, there were a few bits that were jarring. I think a lot of people have had difficulties with Jesse Eisenberg's Lex Luthor. Um, and I can see where they're coming from there. He's a little bit annoying. He's basically playing like, like an amped up version of his character in the social network. But overall, uh, the introduction of, I thought Wonder Woman was quite good. Uh, and whilst the ending, um, you know, isn't ideal and there are some issues, I, I think they at least try to have an ending that, whilst not dissimilar from the ending of Man in terms of levels of destruction, at least they tried to do it in places where there weren't people so that the, 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 the human toll was a lot less than perhaps the, you know, the, the, just the financial toll of buildings being knocked over. Um, but I, yeah, I really enjoyed it. I, I thought it was great fun. And, and I thought, it, and it did look absolutely stunning. And, you know, overall I came out of the cinema thinking that's a good solid eight out of 10 from me. Um, whereas Kaz only gave it seven. And I know they've had, it's had a lot, a lot worse reviews than that from other um, publications. I've got my wife's Facebook status yeah. on here. If you, uh, if you go want. on then, go on it, go on. Batman versus Superman ellipsis. What a load of um, now it's a, a statement that rhymes with butter fight. One of the most badly constructed, acted, directed films I've seen in years. Disjointed, a barely there plot, stupid dream sequences, and then a cheesy <laughs> bit spoiler about mum's twaddle. <laughs> and, and, you know, um, and, you, and you know what, Ed? I'll always go with Casty's review. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, yeah, not impressed. Uh, I just, and as I say, I, it's just the other thing that has been picked up. I don't know where you stand on this, Steve. I'm ultimately, I'm not a huge fan of comic book films either. Um, but I have given the Marvel ones a, a pass in as much. There's a lightness of touch, a slight sort of joy. You know, it's like, I've got superpowers. That's quite cool. This just strikes me as unmitig un unremittingly joyless. Um, yes, no, I would. I would agree with that. The, the, like I said at the beginning, it needed a few laughs. It, it is grim and dark from beginning to end. Hooray! <laughs> uh, there is little light in there, or, or, or certainly little lightness of touch. There's, yeah, no question that, that that one of the really fun things about the Marvel movies is that although they, they do have some darkness occasionally, 
there is there is a lightness attached to them. There is a sense of fun. And, and more of a, a comic book sensibility to them. And this is going for a, a much darker, I mean, a similar tone that they established in Man of Steel. It's just more of that, really. But even probably, I'd say, goes a lot darker, particularly when it comes to Batman, who, you know, is going around branding villains with a with a hot, <laughs> you know, uh, heated bat symbol, literally branding them. Uh, this kind of stuff. It was very dark uh, and really not, uh, I, would, I would say, not a kid's film at all. Um, and and Kirsty's opinion marries up with m- the majority of uh, the critics opinions um fair enough well well it's not just I, that. I did... it's not just that i've been reading the forums as well and there seems to be a there is a definite split down the middle it, it, yeah. it's a real marmite you either like it or you don't there, yeah, I think, there, I think there doesn't seem to be one. much middle ground there no absolutely um a lot of people don't like it like i said uh I actually came out of the cinema thinking, oh, I rather enjoyed that. Yeah, it's not perfect. And yes, structurally, it, there are some issues, which I think might be addressed by the fact that half an hour was cut out. I mean, if it's, it was originally cut, the original cut was three hours and they cut it down to two and a half. That's a whole big chunk of, of plot being removed, which maybe would have helped with the flow of the film. It's, it's, funny, like I said, it's are, funny you say that because most people are saying, where's the plot? <laughs> and... Um, like I said, I mean, and then Kirstie was mentioning it too, there is, a, a, in particular, one dream slash flash forward slash whatever the hell it is that really does seem out of place within the context of the film, but it's clearly there because it's setting up something else. Um, and that kind of franchise setting mentality you know, is, is evident in lots of films these days, and they were doing it in The Force Awakens as well to a certain degree, weren't they? So that, that that's to be expected now. I think the one... One issue people can th- certainly um, with Batman for Superman, um, apart from the clunky, really awful title, is that the fact that the DC are trying to cram in as much as possible in this film in order to start a franchise going. You know, they want to do Justice League, they want to do Wonder Woman movie. Well, they're already shooting the Wonder Woman movie, and they're going to have you know uh, Aquaman and um, and the Flash and Cyborg, and those characters do, albeit very briefly, appear in this film too, um, in a way that I suspect is unsatisfying for the majority of. Uh, fanboys, but I preferred it the way they did it in the film personally because it meant that they weren't trying to shoehorn in too many characters doing too much within what was already a, a overstuffed movie. Um, so y- yes, it's got its flaws. I mean, that's a fun. I mean, fundamentally, the problem with the film is they're trying to create something like the Avengers, but without doing six films beforehand to build up to it. They're kind of just trying to do it straight away. And also, they've clearly brought in Batman, because Batman films were making a billion dollars at the box office. Man still made half a billion. It's like, shit, let's get Batman in, because that will boost the box office, which it clearly has done, because it's already made half a billion in its first weekend. Uh, and, you know, you can easily see it making a billion dollars. So Batman's clearly good box office. And, yeah, and Superman Batman remains also, the dullest superhero. Yeah, and Batman was the best bit of the film. So all I'm thinking is, get on with the a, a, a Ben Affleck directed Batman movie. I'm I'm right up for that. Uh, I'm not really bothered about. It. I'll probably go and see Wonder Woman because it's set in World War One, and again there are references to that in this film. Um, it'd be interesting, I'm sure. And I thought that uh, Gal Gadot was quite good as Wonder Woman. Actually, they're, I mean, what they're trying to do is replicate uh, Marvel's success with the Avengers, and, but they're uh, shortcutting it. Yes, they are. That's, That's the problem. The problem they're trying to do it compressed quickly. and disjointed and ultimately unsatisfactory films. And what I think is very telling about it, he says as someone that very rarely goes to the cinema, so take, take, <laughs> take, take, my, take, my, take my suggestions with, with much salt. But ultimately, it wasn't that you know Marvel felt it was necessary, well, they, they felt it was necessary to, to, to set, set up their universe with, with lots of standalone films. But almost all of those standalone films in turn judged on its own merits is quite watchable it just worries me that dc didn't feel that they had the creative chops or whatever to actually make a series of creditable standalone films before I, lurching into this i this think whole... uh, i think the thing that gets forgotten though ed is that the, there was a lot of false starts with marvel stuff as well though that tends nowadays to be forgotten about certainly um hulk oh yeah there was a few terrible uh, steps in, on the path there before they got things right. So well, you know, to be they, fair, they haven't that, had it all that the stands out, but that's it, as much because uh, actually Hulk has some of the same limitations as yeah. as Superman as a standalone character. Um, so uh, yeah, it, it is is the one the one of all of them that can be quite 
contentedly added at a later you know added into a into a, a group mix um more satisfactory than you can try and get two hours of you know meaningful film out of it yeah but they've they've done a, a pretty reasonable job on balance judged on judged across the spread i've got to say i only caught up with it recently so I, I've, I've come to it pretty late but um i recently watched man of steel in 3d uh on a projector i had in for review i was only going to watch the start of it and you're watching the whole thing and i have to say I, I didn't think it was particularly bad it wasn't fantastically great but um for two hours it entertained me and I, I actually didn't think his Superman was that bad, to be honest. Mm. Um, no, and I've got to take a take. Um, I've got a question. Uh, well, I take not take offence, but um, Kirsty's comment about um, it being badly made and directed. That, I don't agree with that at all. I, I think that you know, the, Kirsty I think has a particular Zach, dislike of Zack Snyder. Okay, right. I, I was going to say, I think in my mind, Zack Snyder. Whatever you might think about the plotting or, or Zack Snyder's direction, directorial style. The, um, the as like I said, the money's on the screen. It looks spectacular. I thought that uh, I'm, I should imagine. I, did, I mean, I saw it in 2D. Go and see it as an IMAX 3D experience. I mean, it will be an experience. Uh, you know, in that sense, it's a, it's a, you know, like almost like a ride, and and you can take them you know, ride the movie and, and go through the, all the experiences. And it will look and sound, and sound incredible. Um, can't wait to see it on disc, particularly a longer cut. But you know, that's the way modern filmmaking is becoming. It's becoming as much an experience as it is, you know, about the film itself. And, and in that sense, I think it was a triumph. Uh, I think, like I said, I think they absolutely nailed Batman. I think it looks stunning. I think it was well made. Um, yes, it has issues, which from the very beginning, the idea of trying to cram all this stuff in and, and start a franchise or jumpstart a franchise without really putting the groundwork in, those are issues that the film is going to be cobbled, you know, it's hobbled by that from the very beginning. But I think given all that, the end result was a lot more enjoyable and a lot better than I expected it to be. And that, that was probably why. I mean, I think I went in with such low expectations that I couldn't be disappointed. I was, I was just going to say you probably went in with, yeah, yeah. That, that would make sense. I, 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 I'm just waiting to, to see what the comments are under this podcast because I think it's going to be a lively debate um, because I think, you know, just reading the comments so far and reading stuff online and Twitter and so on, it's a real Marmite movie. Um, and like you say, it's made a hell of a lot of money. Um, it'll be interesting to see what the second week takings are yeah, on, yeah. on it, um, because obviously everybody's gone. It's Easter weekend as well, so uh, it's an excuse to go to the cinema, isn't it? For some people, the likes of me and Ed, it'll never will be. Well, first you went to see the Eddie the Eagle movie out last night. <laughs> so think of that. Well, actually, she she said it's perfectly watchable. Uh, it's not something she should be making a repeat journey for, but you know, it's, it's all right. So, she's not fancy uh, going to see Zootropolis then. Um, I don't. Because apparently, know. that's really good. Yeah, I don't know what the backstory is behind that, but I think there's actually, uh, it's actually there, there's not many showings of it at the MK Cine World, which I think has uh, right. shaped it, her, shaped her her viewing decisions more than anything else. So, I stayed at home. <laughs> Well, your turntable and your records. Mm. Well, and, 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 and your, that. And, and your slippers um, and your smoking jacket. That and uh, obviously any hour change, forward or backwards. <laughs> if, you have, if you have a toddler, I would gladly hunt down the person who, who came up with this concept and just nightmarish. And it will be just as nightmarish. Where people go, oh, you get an extra hour in bed. Do you bollocks? No, no, you no, have a, no, no. You've you got, you got an hour years. less. you got an hour I'm, less. I'm, I'm, you know, I'm good to get up. And it's like, ah. So, yeah, that's not been a lot of fun. With, so I like Kirsty have a night. I always find it when it goes forward, for some reason, for a couple of days afterwards, I'm completely off off track because it, it seems like the day's gone too quick. Mm-hmm. I don't know why. It just does that to me for some strange reason. Anyway, well, that, that, that's that was... That's going to apply to today as well, Phil, because it's nearly 12 o'clock already. It's like, what the hell happened to today? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh, anyway, so that's Batman, Superman, and we also got a bonus review there of uh, Eddie, <laughs> Eddie the Eagle <laughs> Edwards. Uh, film right so very quickly because we are over time steve um blu-ray releases uh there's only one release uh next week um that i could find of any interest we that next week's got to be one of the, the quietest weeks i've ever seen for blu-ray releases there's quite a lot the week after but next week the only film coming out on blu-ray is kill your friends which is a satirical look at a homicidal psychopathic a r man in the 90s um which we reviewed at the cinema and was mm, okay but uh I don't think it's going to be high up anyone's list of um, purchases, I suspect. Well, 
Stunning. That's me running to the supermarket. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, in fairness, I haven't seen it, so I can't really comment. I have read the book, though. <laughs> that said, do you know what appear- has appeared in my local Sainsbury's near the vinyl? Blue- vinyl. <laughs> no 4K Blu-ray. Obviously, it's a bit early days for that, but no, we've got a nice big big stand of records. No, Rubbish it, records. It, it was quite interesting. There was a. I, I'm sure we've seen something similar to it a few weeks ago, but uh, maybe a few months ago, but. Um, the, they always have their returns, royalty returns, from uh, different sectors and how much um, artists get paid. And um, uh, vinyl was £100,000 more in royalties than uh, royalties from YouTube for artists. Oh, yeah, I can believe that. So. Um, I, I mean, un- again, unfortunately, it's not it's not a fair spread. You do get the feeling that David Gilmore gets quite a lot more for each pressing of Rattle That Lock than... <laughs> You know, some up and comer with their their release, but I still thought it was quite heartening to see. Um, I did feel like sticking a little poster up saying, "Don't buy the a record player that costs eighty pounds, you madmen." But, so you know. the, this final bubble's going to burst soon, isn't it? Because I yes. mean, all, all the hipsters are gotten on on it now, and and you know, it's everywhere. Like you say, it's in the supermarkets. So the bubble's going to burst again soon, and and you'll have your little niche back again. You'll be able to enjoy it again. Yes, and prices of used stuff will hopefully. Uh, I think crash is the wrong word, but they should settle down. Things should uh, become a bit more sensible. And um, yeah, uh, it, it is at the moment. It's now into full full hype mode um i think once things do do sort of end there will be uh, you know a useful extra number of people who came in during the book would go do you know what i don't care if it's no longer fashionable that's fine i don't have a problem with that but yeah um it it, it has to end sooner or later and yeah i get i get my hobby back it'd be nice although i probably won't get to review as much stuff for you guys about (laughs) and what um, what sort of records were on sale in the same piece uh two led zeppelin some bowie uh, hmm. Foo Fighters Greatest Hits, which I actually you know, was momentarily tempted by. Um, Adele, if you know you fancy some uh, some 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 estrogen delivered in vinyl form. Um and yeah, you know, it wasn't a huge huge selection. And how how much did they cost? Ranged between twelve and eighteen pounds. Jesus. Hmm. That's, so. That seems quite cheap. Some the vinyl life seems way well, more than well, that. Well, well, well the last time the last time I bought vinyl in a shop. Um, an al- an album was eight pounds. Well, yeah, but that was presumably. I'm not knocking you here, but that presumably that was quite a while ago. Oh, that was well, that was uh, early nineties. The last yeah, I bought vinyl was five pound ninety nine p. That was in the mid to late eighties. It's. At, I mean, that pricing is 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 directly competitive with with Amazon, etc. So you know, and um, they're not taking any risks with the material they've selected. Fair play to them. See how it goes. Yeah. Personally, um, I happily bought um, Peter Gabriel's third album after talking with you about it um, on CD for eight ninety nine. So that'll be me. Splendid. I, I, you know, as I say, I could have indulged in a spot of illegal file sharing if you'd wanted. You could have had eyes. <laughs> no, no, no. I want. I like to own the CD. Oh, bless. <laughs> um, so yeah, I, I finally got round to buying a copy of uh, Leftism uh, at the Bring Your Own Hi Fi show. Embarrassingly, never had on vinyl, so I was quite pleased with that. And I got Massive Attack's Mezzanine. Um, which is usually really expensive, but there were some ones with some sleeves damaged at the corners, which I couldn't give a damn about. <laughs> and uh, finally, uh, Terry Kelly is What Colour Is Love, which has got the most 70s album cover in, in the known universe uh, and is magnificent. So, all good. It was yeah. a good show. Very okay. pleased with that. Okay, I have no recollection of how we got into this subject from Kill Your Friends on Blu-ray, but there you go. <laughs> Um, supermarkets what was in my supermarket there you go right okay uh, that is it for the podcast this week we've uh, we've gone over time yet again but you can stay tuned for a very special podcast it's the last podcast is going to go out on a Wednesday that's the 6th of April so that's next Wednesday's podcast and within that we're going to have an interview with Spectrical and we're going to go over most of the answers to some of the stuff that we talked about earlier on so EOTF and, and standards and how uh, 4k Blu-ray is going to affect things and and so on so uh, stay tuned for that it is a very interesting if technical interview we will have some uh, guidance at the start of that in terms of uh, terminologies and and uh, 
we'll call it a glossary. <laughs> we'll have a glossary before we start next week. But it is an interesting interview. So come along for that one. And then following that, uh, the podcast changes to a Monday. So we've got the 6th of April next Wednesday. That's the last podcast on a Wednesday. And then we change to Monday the 11th as the first podcast to come out on a Monday. You get two days early. So stay tuned for that. My thanks to Steve Weathers. Good night, sweet prince. Parting is inevitable. Mark Hodgkinson. Destroy Superman now. And Ed Sally. Back at home, they told me to sing in space. Don't forget you can follow us on Twitter and Facebook, bookmark AV forums for latest reviews, news and video. And of course, leave us those five stars on iTunes. It has to be five stars. And uh, we'll read your name out. I'm Phil Hinton. Thanks very much for listening. And we'll see you again next Wednesday. <laughs>